Contract risks, all sorts of problems that can happen. Overbilling, underbilling, abuse. This is Office Hours. The show for sharing experiences and stories in governance, risk management, and compliance. Welcome to Office Hours. Today I have my good friend Sergio, and he's going to talk about uncovering the dark data in contract compliance. Sergio. Reflecting back on my career as an external risk management consultant, one of my favorite things to do was to look into contract compliance. Now, I don't hear a lot of people tell me that their favorite thing to do is contract compliance. Well, exactly. Because, Kevin, imagine, there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of written contract conditions written by lawyers who are hard to understand. And I'm not a lawyer. And most people in risk management and in accounting and auditing are not. So they don't like looking into contracts. I guess I'm different because I love discovering where that can take me because they are a minefield for finding juicy bits of financial and compliance uh, irregularities. So there's lots of opportunity to find big problems and and lots of revenue or money within these contract problems is what you're saying. Huge. It's it's like in 95% of the contracts I have ever looked at, I've always found something to recover, something to correct, some compliance issues that were violated. Love it. It's like a game for me. I want to know how much and how deep and how wide can I assess this contract and recover uh, funds for the company and in, 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 to protect their interests. That's really cool. So I'm assuming you're going to share some of those experiences with us today? Absolutely. Happy to do so. One of the things that contracts are unique in is that they contain numerous and complex contract requirements. Again, as I mentioned, written by lawyers. But they are interpreted in turn by other people in the workflow, like in accounting, they have to take it and interpret how it's going to be built. In operations, they're going to have to interpret how to record contract activity. Mm -hmm. In a contract uh, uh, audit, they have to blend all of these systems together and look at how things are performing and whether they're conforming. So very, very complex, lots of people involved. And it's just inherent in the contracts that they are not very easy to take apart and implement and practically manage them, you know, with full compliance. Yeah, and then in my short experience with contracts, usually there's developers involved who are taking these because contracts are very customizable and often systems aren't. So often there's developers taking these customized contracts and doing custom coding to account for it on the billing or the ERP side. That's exa- You're absolutely right. And, and it's complicated further by many other factors that, that, that play into that. One is, yes, they contain multiple logic. Some of it is quantitative, some of it is qualitative, and some of it requires interpretation. But you also have a disintegration in company systems that contain fragments of this contract all along. So you have CRM systems that might capture some of the contract data. You Then you have the CMS systems and ERPs and legal and shared drives and memos and all. By the time you end up spreading the contract throughout the company systems, it loses elements and then it breaks down in the execution. So because you have such a mix of people working on these contracts is, is, is very, very likely that somewhere there's a breakdown and misalignment. Right. There's a lot of risk in there, it sounds like. Huge, huge. And what makes it worse, you know, these compressed timelines that contracts are usually carried under and limited room for a kind of timely review and preventing of errors and high volume of dollars, almost always in every contract that I've picked up um, uh, led to materials, mistakes, or risk of penalties for non-compliance. Yeah, what you're saying about compressed timelines is people just want to get to working and get on the project or get the customer and I guess really easy to try to fast forward that process and a lot of mistakes can be made in 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 that process. That's exactly right. And you know, it's true of any industry you're in. It doesn't matter what vertical you belong to and what kind of contracts are are equally complex everywhere. In fact, what I want to share today is three experiences from three different industries. Uh, These are actually three actual cases that I worked on and in the interest of anonymity, I uh, disguised the description of the entities to protect them. But uh, one of them was a global shipping company, another one was a municipal school district, and then the third one was a global uh, aircraft services company. So as you can see, couldn't be any more different between these. A pretty wide range of use cases, but I'm assuming all of them had interesting 
different contract problems. That, that's exactly right. So the first company I want to talk to you about is that global shipping company I was telling you about. They're, they're a multi-billion dollar global shipping company, like major, you know, shipping vessels, containers, you name it, all of that. Many thousands of employees, right? And, and, and then we, we, what we did is we were engaged to review uh, the stevedoring services contract for one of their locations. Uh, and they had a third-party contractor there that handled the cargo uh, for them. Now, this happened to be uh, located in the United States, um, and that particular location. And the contract uh, was, was somewhat complex, but not overly complex. But one of the things that it drew my attention was because shipping companies usually deal in international units of measure like metric system and then the u.s contracts usually written in the um, in imperial uh, system of measurement what drew my attention right away was that the contract was written in short tons okay and then the shipping manifest obviously been reported in metric tons okay so I did a quick calculate. I, I got the data for all the six years of billing, and of course, 10% variance in the weight results in, in huge differences in, in how much these services can cost. So obviously, it was, was a big discrepancy for the company. What, which way was it? Which one? They weren't converting to the metric tons, or they, do you they, remember? Yeah, they were not converting to the short tons. Oh, to so, the short so, tons. So because the billing was supposed to be uh, on a fee per short ton, because the location was in the U.S. and the Steve Adoring company was operating uh, on short ton, uh, ton billing system, um, but they were taking it one to one from the uh, manifest, the travel, right. the cargo manifest. And then this was just one location. Was it just one contract? That one you location, at? one contract. So wow. you can imagine. You found a material problem in yes. the contract, and then you ex exponentially across all of their locations and all their contracts, they probably had. Maybe not everyone, but they probably had similar problems everywhere. Yeah, you know, it's, it's a high likelihood. And, and as we were talking during the break, you know, if, if as you were saying, right, if you're a global company that deals in units and measures uh, from uh, various geographies, various systems of, of conversion, then, then you need to pay attention to these details. Yeah, I think that's the key takeaway here. Mm -hmm. Anyone who has contracts that deal in units of measure, uh, this could be a key area for you to look at how are how are you converting from one unit of measure to another, especially if you're global and, mm -hmm. and they differ in different regions. Yeah, and it has many, many implications, right? Because sometimes uh, weight is important for billing, but sometimes it's important for regulatory compliance as well. Right. The next uh, use case that I want to share with you, this one was a little bit more compounded uh, with problems. Um, this was I was auditing some construction contracts on behalf of a municipal school district. And this was about, uh, the district had about a billion dollars in spend budget, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of their um, uh, activities. They had about 5,000 employees and about 50,000 uh, students. So I just picked one construction project of the many that okay. obviously school districts engage in. So they would contract out any uh, construction that needed to be done for the school district. And That's you were, right. You were looking into those contracts and whether there was any problem. That's right, yeah, uh, to, to check for billing accuracies, for conformity with contract terms. So, so this was a contract that kind of had multiple elements in it. It had uh, stipulations for labor, charges for materials, for equipment, for overhead, and it was a very complex multi-tier contract. And uh, when I started looking at the billings, uh, my first instinct is to look at the complexities in the contract that might be hard to convert to a billing system uh, workflow. You know, right. So one of the things there that they stipulate in the contract is Equipment could be charged a standby rate if that particular equipment was needed for the day. Like say a bulldozer, you need you come in the morning, you do two hours of work, and then the construction workers perform their jobs, and then at the end of the day, you might need the bulldozer to finish it off. So between two hours in the morning, two hours at the end of the day, you have standby hours, like four. So right. they were entitled to a standby rate. That makes sense. If you need a bulldozer and the company needs to go out and get one and bring it on site, but there's going to be, say, four hours out of the eight hours in the day, the bulldozer isn't going to be used. They want to still get paid for that because the bulldozer is there and it took them so much effort. So they get 
a few hours of standby on either side. Yeah, it makes sense. It's an opportunity yeah. cost because I could have used it on another job and charged for the whole eight hours, for example. So it yeah, makes, sense. makes sense. It's fair, right? Now, the rate was lower, obviously, but it still was a rate that they were entitled. Now, if you looked at all the equipment standby charges, what quickly became evident is that they were charging for equipment for days on end, making it look like all of their equipment anywhere it was located that wasn't used on any jobs was charged to this contract. You know, how can you have a bulldozer charge for three days of standby when a contract says if it's bro broken up within a day? Well, that seems like a nice way to maximize the revenue coming in on your contract <laughs> equipment, but it doesn't sound like it was in the spirit of this particular contract. Exactly. And, and these are the kind of things that the billing system might m miss. You know, if if you bring uh, some kind of um, uh, work order from, the, from a job site, it says standby rate, you just process it through and you don't give it another thought, you know, qualitatively examine is that Measure, measuring up to the conditions that are logical in the contract that, that this billing system can't account for. Would you call this contract abuse or were people doing this on purpose? Was it an oversight? You know, we certainly suspected this and that's why this turned out into a litigation engagement later um, because when we started looking deeper, even some of the contract rates and provisions that were stipulated in a contract document when compared to the billing documents were not aligned, the various rates that had been charged. And the contract was also somewhat vague. It required parties to actively uh, engage and clarify what it means. Right. And so when you took the worst case scenario and quantified all of the contract stipulations versus all the billings for you know a, a several month period, I quickly quantified about 900,000 in overbillings just on the differences alone. Wow. Yeah, so I guess the key takeaway here is when you're reviewing contracts and trying to make sure that they're in line with what's actually happening, to look for places where there could be opportunities for, um, for overbilling or maybe some misuse or high probability of human error due to the complexity mm -hmm. of the contract. Mm -hmm. Analyze some analyze some data and see if the patterns of the data are aligned with um, what you would expect to see from the contract. That's exactly right. One of the lessons that I took from many many years of contract reviews is, you know, the tendency for us um, analytic uh, aficionados is to jump into the data and start slicing and dicing and cutting it up. Right. But it saved me a lot of time when I changed my strategy because. You know, the straightforward linear computations that the system is able to do, those, y there's no point in wasting time computing that. Yeah. But, Much lower likelihood of there being a problem there. Yeah, and, and you then sort of invalidate the use of analytics and it becomes like, oh, it's a lot of time and a lot of money, but it doesn't yield any kind of results. So what I discovered is like, what are the rules that the ERP system cannot handle or potentially the breakdown in the process uh, can cause a, a, a discrepancy in, and what are the rules that I need to program into my analytics, the, the qualitative, the quantitative, the logical, the passage of time, any of these kind of variables that is hard to program right. in a standard system, and then I start with those. And then I do one or two validations of a subset of data and see, hey, my theory is true, like, with, like I did with the uh, short tons and metric tons. I picked a few bills. I looked at it. That's when after that I went to get the data. And it gives you the opportunity to say, I know which data I need. So it narrows down the scope. And I know which logic to run through it. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to find a sizable chunk. So it's a kind of inverted the process. Yeah, know the know the problem you're trying to solve before you go and spend a bunch of time analyzing data. Use your professional judgment and your experience to know where to prioritize and what to look for. That's exactly right, and that's, that's why I'm really good. That's a really good tip for people out there who are trying to become more data-driven in their process. That's exactly right. That's why I'm so passionate about contract reviews because you can spend 90% of your allotted time on reviewing and understanding the contract. And because you know analytic technology is so quick, you know I can compute all of these errors in 10% of the time that, I'm, that I have left and come up with something tangible. Yeah. So this is where it's like a great relationship where technology uh, frees you up to, to use professional judgment to uncover those dark data elements that you don't even know you need to look for mm -hmm. and then be able to zero uh, in on exactly the uh, areas where the potential problem could be. All right, what is, uh, what's your third, um, your third customer experience? 
Well, the third one was uh, an aircraft uh, services company, global aircraft services company, uh, greater than uh, $1 billion in revenue, about 5,000 employees globally. And I just picked one maintenance contract um, they, they, that they had, and, and this was for a public sector organization that they were maintaining some of their aircraft. It was, uh, you know, a standard contract for maintenance, repair, and overhaul services of, of, of uh, aviation equipment. And again, it had the provisions for parts and labor and equipment and all of these kind of things. Um, and again, I started looking for those provisions that are nonlinear things that are difficult to um, uh, program into a standard ERP and billing system. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I saw there was that the customer was entitled to uh, a 10% discount based on the volume of parts that they would use. If they reach a certain level, then the discount uh, from that point forward uh, takes on the effect. Right. And some of it was retroactive. So if they reach that level, then they can go back and reclaim some of the amounts that they have paid before. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So imagine programming this in a standard ERP system. Could Again, get really complicated, especially being giving a retroactive discount can't be a simple thing to program. That's exactly right. So it's a nonlinear event. It's passage of time, accumulation of a volume. And these are the type of things that, you know, as, you, as we said, you know, you get busy executing the contract <laughs> and you forget to check for all these things. So I looked through the whole contract. I looked at some other qualitative um, uh, provisions that were there, the type of reporting that they need to do when a certain hour is reached and so on, the, the lump sum payments that they might be entitled to. So it was kind of both ways. I found that my client, in some instances, was overbilling their client because they didn't give this volume discount. But in other instances, they were not taking advantage of the contract provisions that they had to bill higher or to bill ahead of time to collect money and or get, you know, a contract completion credit. So once you zero in on these issues, you can then again, using analytic technology, you can download contract activity data and quickly quantify both ways. Right. And find the find the problems really quickly and then and then basically action on them to fix them or make them better. Yeah. And in this particular instance, because the client was kind of proactive about self-auditing themselves, they approached the customer, self-reported these, remediated and actually improved the relationship uh, in the end. And the customer had more reasons to trust and kind of believe that they're dealing with a company that has integrity and is conscientious of following the contract agreement. Yeah, there's not too many vendors out there that come back and say, hey, we'd like to give you some money back. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So it's, it's fun, it's rewarding, there's always um, contract uh, dark corners that, that you need to shed your light on. And, and again, you can, you can get tons of data and millions of records, but if you don't know what you're looking for, you'll be wasting your time. You'll be frustrating the people that you're working with. But if you do, uh, you spend a, an hour even looking at some of these complicated issues, you know, within a couple days sometimes I would find things that paid for my time and then some. Right. Yeah. So what you're saying is don't start with the 10 million records of data. Start with the contract. That's exactly right. Read through the contract. What, where are the nonlinear potential complex, complex problems that the contract is trying to solve for? Mm -hmm. And then what are the areas within there that are the highest risk or could be the highest dollar uh, turnover? Mm -hmm. And then focus your attention on finding if there is a problem there, and then if there is, then you can go and get the population of data um, to, quant to help quantify that problem. That's exactly right, which is kind of a nice segue to sort of some of the lessons learned. Uh, first, as you were saying, yes, understand the contract, know the conditions, look for those complex um, nonlinear provisions. Then define and deploy meaningful analytics ahead of time to monitor for the um, unusual conditions and when they are triggered. Mm -hmm. So when, when there's passage of time or accumulation of volume or whatever the case may be, build in triggers on your continuous monitoring analytics to monitor for that event. And then build in an alert that says, hey, at this point, a milestone in a contract has been reached that requires a different manner of handling. And then you intervene. And so right. you don't even then have to conduct contract audits at the end. Yeah, because it could be very costly to implement these types of complicated rules directly in the system. That's right. So you may just want to monitor for them and then trigger some manual intervention to 
um, to accommodate for those scenarios. That's right. You know, your, your ERP system is probably perfectly able to handle 80% of the contract activity. These other 10 to 20% of, of deviations, you can easily and cheaply um, uh, cover for with analytics without hiring expensive consulting help to program or amend or reconfigure your Salesforce or your, uh, you know, SAP or PeopleSoft or whatever uh, system. Great advice. Yeah. So, so the lessons that I learned kind of in summary here is that, you know, managing contracts is a lot like, you know, a game of chess. You, you know, the moves are defined, the rules are defined, but you don't know necessarily which way it's going to end up. It's not linear. Uh, but ERP systems are very automated, very linear, and have very limited options for uh, conditional uh, 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 requirements. So these, these nonlinear conditions then can be defined, as we spoke, through uh, analytics, through uh, kind of continuous monitoring, and you can monitor for the occurrence of those events. And once they occur, you can alert the uh, individuals involved, apply professional judgment, resolve the matter, recalibrate your one-time billing or your full go-forward billing in the system, and keep going. That'll save a whole lot, a ton of money and headaches in, in the long run. And believe me, over my career auditing contracts, I've never failed to walk away with, with, with uh, without any findings. <laughs> yeah, so that's great. So anyone out there, if your company, your company must deal with some type of contracts, there's probably some low-hanging fruit for you to now go and take back and try to find if uh, any problems using some of the tips we got today. That's exactly right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Serge. I think everybody who's watched the episode will have something they can take back and think about. Uh, We'll see you next time.